Hey guys, welcome back to a new video. In this session, we will be looking at the motion of an object on an inclined plane. It will be the first video in my series on two-dimensional kinematics, and it's a direct follow-up on my video on one-dimensional kinematics. Here, I will be solving a complete exercise step-by-step -step to give you the understanding and the tools you need to solve virtually any exercise on this topic. Before we start, I want to briefly mention that if you have any suggestions for future topics, let me know in the comment section below. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. As you can see, I've pre-drawn the inclined plane and the plane itself has a maximum height of 10 meters and it makes an angle of 30 degrees with the ground. The object that we'll be studying is at the top of this plane and it will slide down towards the ground under the force of gravity which I've drawn here as the red vector. To study the motion of this object, we will be answering two questions. First, what will be the time for the object to reach the ground sliding along this plane? And we will compare this time with a scenario where there would be no inclined plane. So if the object would just free fall from 10 meters high. The second question that we'll be answering is what will be the velocity when the object reaches the ground? So the velocity at arrival. And again, we will compare this with the velocity it would have if it would just free fall towards the ground from 10 meters. And this already gives you a conceptual question. What do you think? In which scenario will the object have the largest velocity when it reaches the ground? When it free falls or when it slides across the plane? Let's now answer these questions in a systematic approach. And we first look at the time it takes for the object to reach the ground. We will first look at the scenario where our object is in free fall. So there is no inclined plane and we just have an object that falls towards the ground from a height of 10 meters under the force of gravity. Here we will use the formula for a free falling object in one dimension, which says that x of t is equal to one half times its acceleration times the time it needs to reach the ground squared. And this time is exactly what we are looking for. So we can rewrite or rearrange this formula so that we get that t, the time for the object to reach the ground, is the square root of two times the distance to the ground divided by its acceleration. And we know in this case that x is equal to 10 meters and that a, the acceleration, is simply equal to g, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. So we can actually directly calculate this time. So we get that t is equal to the square root of 20 meters divided by 9.81 meters per second squared. And being a good physicist means that you always check out the units to see whether you made any mistakes. We see that the meter here drops out and the second squared in the denominator in the denominator becomes a second square in the enumerator and taking the square root of this, we are left with the unit of seconds, which is indeed the unit of time. And if we then take the square root of 20 divided by 9.81, we get a time of 1.427 seconds. And this is the time that the object would fall if there were no inclined plane and it would just fall straight down. Now that we found the time for our object to free fall down to the ground, we can compare it with the corresponding time for our object to slide down the inclined plane and reach the ground. And that is what we will be calculating right now. The first step in this calculation is to choose and draw our coordinate axis, meaning to draw the x and y axis that we will use as a reference frame to study the motion of our object. This is a crucial step and is often brushed over or not well explained. This is why I will explain in detail why we choose the axis that we choose. For exercises on an inclined plane, we will always use the x-axis to be parallel to our inclined plane, to the surface of our inclined plane. And consequently, our y-axis will always be perpendicular to our inclined plane. Now, why do we use this perhaps not so evident coordinate axis. Why in this way? Well, we see that when the object now slides across the surface of our inclined plane, its y-coordinate will not change. 
and it will only have a motion in the x direction. This means that we have now reduced our two-dimensional kinematics problem, our two-dimensional motion of the object, to a one-dimensional kinematics problem. And this makes it much easier to solve this exercise. To make this even more clear, let's say that we had chosen this coordinate axis. So the one that might spring to mind first. We see that if the object now slides down the plane, both the x coordinate and the y coordinate will change. The y coordinate will actually decrease and the x coordinate will increase. And this makes it a two dimensional kinematics problem. However, by choosing our axis as we did here, we will have reduced our problem to a one dimensional motion. Because we now have a problem in one dimension, we can use the one dimensional kinematics formula that we also used in this previous section for the free fall of our object. We have that x of t, so the distance traveled in a time t, is equal to its initial position x0 plus its initial velocity times the time that it travels plus one half times its acceleration in this direction times the time squared. And again, we can simplify this by noting that x0 is again 0 and our initial velocity is also 0 because we are starting from rest. And we see that our x of t, our distance traveled, is equal to 1 half acceleration times time squared. Again, in this exercise, we're looking exactly for this time, the time the object needs to reach the ground sliding down the inclined plane. So we can again rewrite this formula to get an expression for time. We have time is equal to the square root of two times the distance x of t divided by a, the acceleration. You probably already noticed that this is exactly the same formula that we had before for our free falling object. However, now there is a very large difference. This x of t is not 10 meters again. It's the distance traveled across the inclined plane. And this acceleration is also not the acceleration g, which is just the acceleration due to gravity, but it will be the acceleration in the direction of motion. Because remember, we're dealing here with a one dimensional motion. And so this acceleration has to be in the direction of the motion. This means that before we can simply fill in this formula and calculate t, we have to calculate the x of t and this a. And let's start with a, the acceleration in the direction of our motion. Let's go back to our sketch. We see here that what we need to find is the acceleration in this direction, in the direction of motion, the x direction in this case. And we'll call this a. We know that this will be a vector a, and what we need in our formula is the magnitude of this vector a. So let's see how we can get this acceleration. To find an expression for the magnitude of this acceleration in the x direction, we start with drawing our coordinate system, x and y, but now under the angle that we're most familiar with. And if we compare it with our initial sketch at the beginning, we know that if our coordinate system is angled like this, that our gravitational acceleration vector g will actually be drawn like this. Again, if we compare with our initial sketch, we see that we rotated our coordinate system and thus our gravity acceleration vector will also be rotated and slanted. Again, we are looking at the acceleration in the x direction and by rotating our coordinate system and the gravity vector in this way, we see that what we are looking for, the acceleration in the x direction due to gravity, is actually simply the x component of our gravity vector. And we actually know how to calculate the magnitude of the x component of our gravity vector. If we define this angle as alpha, we know that the magnitude of a is simply equal to the magnitude of g, so our gravity vector, times the cosine of alpha, this angle alpha. And since we know that the magnitude of the gravitational vector is 9.81 meters per second squared, the only thing left now is to find what angle this alpha is. And for this, we again go back to our initial drawing. 
we see that our angle alpha is actually equal to this upper left angle of our triangle. Why is this? Well, this is exactly because we chose our x coordinate axis to be parallel to the slant to the surface of our inclined plane. And this is why this angle here of our triangle will be exactly the same as the angle alpha that we need. Now, because we know that this inclined plane has a angle of 30 degrees with the ground, we know that this angle is right angled, so it will be 90 degrees. And we know that the total sum of the angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. So we know that alpha is equal to 180 degrees minus 90 degrees minus 30 degrees, which is equal to 60 degrees. So we know that our angle alpha will be 60 degrees. So we can go back to our formula here and we can simply fill this in. This will be equal to 9.81 meters per second squared times the cosine of 60 degrees. And the cosine of 60 degrees is simply one half. So we get that the magnitude of A, which is the acceleration due to gravity in the x direction, so in the direction of the inclined plane, is simply equal to 4.905 meters per second squared. And this is already the first piece of the puzzle that we need, because we now already have the magnitude A in our formula. So what we are left with now is to determine this x of t, which is the distance that our object will have to travel across the inclined plane. And this we will calculate right now. The distance x that we need can be easily calculated by considering simple geometry principles. And for this, we redraw our inclined plane, but now as a triangle. So we know that this angle is 30 degrees. We know that this angle is 60 degrees, which we calculated in the previous step. We know that this distance is 10 because the height of the inclined plane is 10 meters. And what we need to find now is this length of this side of the triangle, which will be equal to x of t, the distance that the object needs to travel. We know from simple geometry that the sine of 30 degrees, which is the sine of this angle, is simply equal to 10, which is this side of the triangle, divided by L, the length of this side of the triangle. So we can easily rewrite this formula to see that L is equal to 10 divided by the sine of 30 degrees. And since the sine of 30 degrees is equal to one half, we get 10 divided by one half is equal to 20. So we know that L or X of T is equal to 20 meters. And now we already have the second piece of our puzzle, which means that we can now bring it all together again to get that T, the time needed for our object to reach the ground sliding across the inclined plane, is equal to the square root of two times X of T divided by A, which is the formula that we got from rearranging the one dimensional kinematics formula, which will be equal to 40 meters divided by 4.905 meters per second squared. And again, being a good physicist, we check our units. So this meter and this meter cancels out. This second square in the denominator of the denominator becomes a second square in the enumerator and taking the square of this second squared we indeed get a solution with units of second meaning the units of time and then running the square root of 40 divided by 4.905 we will get a end solution of 2.885 seconds so this is the time that our object will slide across the inclined plane before it reaches the ground. And this can now be directly compared with the time we calculated for our object to free fall towards the ground, which was 1.427 seconds. So we see clearly that our object will reach the ground slower when it travels across the inclined plane. And this brings us now to the second part of this exercise, which will be much shorter, but not less interesting. It's to calculate for both scenarios the velocity at arrival when, it, when the object reaches the ground. 
To calculate this, we will use the same formula for both scenarios, which is that the velocity at a specific time t is equal to its initial velocity plus its acceleration times the time t. And as in previous cases, we can simplify this formula by noting that our initial velocity v0 is in both scenarios zero, because in both scenarios we're starting from rest. And we get that our velocity after a specific time t is equal to the acceleration times t. And well, what is this t? This is exactly the time that we calculated for the object to reach the ground, whether it be by free falling or by sliding down the inclined plane. So we have this time t. And this acceleration will also be different for the different scenarios. For the scenario where the object free falls towards the ground, it's the full acceleration of gravity, 9.81 meters per second squared. But when we consider the motion down the inclined plane, we look for the acceleration in the x direction, so the direction that the object is moving in, which we calculate to be 4.905 meters per second. So let's compare both scenarios now. And you can already try to guess in which scenario the object will have a larger velocity when reaching the ground. Let's first look at the free fall case. We have that the velocity at time t, which is the time when it reaches the ground, is equal to its acceleration, so 9.81 meters per second squared, times the time that it needs to reach the ground, which we calculate to be 1.427 seconds. And again, we look at the units, we see that this second drops with one power of this second, and our solution will indeed be in meters per second, which is a velocity. Running this through a calculator, we see that we get 14 meters per second. Comparing this to the inclined plane motion, we again get the velocity after a time t is equal to its acceleration in the x direction, which we found to be 4.905 meters per second squared, times the time to reach the ground, which we found to be 2.885 seconds. And also here, the units check out, we get a solution in meters per second, and this solution will actually be, again, 14 meters per second. So what we see here is that both velocities are actually the same when our object reaches the ground, whether it be by free falling, or whether it be by sliding across the inclined plane. Now this is no coincidence, and it will be always the case for every inclined plane, whatever the angle or its height. And it has to do with the concept of conservation of energy, which we will do plenty of exercises on in future videos. Now of course this was a simplified scenario, where we did not include friction from sliding across the plane. If we did include friction, then some of the energy of the object will go into heating up the inclined plane, and therefore it will have a slower velocity when it reaches the ground compared to free falling. But this will all be more clear in future videos. And this brings us to the end of this video, and I hope that you are now more familiar with how to solve two-dimensional kinematics exercises of objects sliding down an inclined plane. We saw that we can reduce these exercises to one-dimensional kinematics exercises by choosing our coordinate system wisely. If you have any questions about anything in the video, please let me know in the comments down below. And if you learned something, give the video a thumbs up. And if you want to get notified by future releases, consider subscribing. And with that, I thank you for watching, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.